Okay, we're back live at NAB. This is theCUBE, siliconangle.com, siliconangle.tv's uh, telecast where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. And obviously the theme has been software. We're going to continue that with this segment. I'm John Furrier, the founder of siliconangle.com, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of wikibon.org. And John, we're, we're going to talk about special effects and the tech behind special effects. Mark Schonagel is uh, a tech evangelist at uh, Autodesk, yeah. which is a very interesting topic, right? I mean, yeah. uh, we, we all yeah. know the special effects, we know them, we love them, can connect to them, but. Yeah, this continues our theme of software, really taking advantage of all the latest and greatest in hardware. And, uh, you know, Mark, studios have had put a lot of demands on hardware and have actually bought a lot of big systems in the past because they got to power, power their work. Sure, absolutely. So what's going on in studios? Um, you go in there, you're knocking on the doors every day, talking to them about their, their challenges, their opportunities, and, and providing solutions, and obviously Autodesk, a uh, leader in software over the years, going back to the PC now through the IN. What's the update on studios and what you guys are doing with them? Oh man, it's, uh, things are exploding. I think uh, you know, a few years ago we came out with 64-bit technology. I remember getting my first dual core with eight gigs of RAM, thinking what am I going to do with all this stuff, right? Now I've got 32 cores and 16, 32 gigs of RAM, whatever, and I'm still wanting more. It's a um, data center and a, and a laptop, right? Yeah, pretty much, it's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> you know, geez, you, you go to these big studios and their render farms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the demands are getting bigger and bigger, and you know, a lot of it's just the effects we're doing. I mean, we're doing fluid simulations that, you know, just five years ago, I would have thought were you know, 20 years away. Um, it's really the multi-core, the multi-core angle that Intel's been able to provide has just been amazing for our industry. Yeah, let's talk about the multi-core angle, that's a good one. So like the studios, we've been talking with uh, some practitioners like Showreel, that if you give them the power, the Ferrari, and keep on upgrading the cars, yeah. they're going to do, they're going to they're ride it, and so they're going to push it. So what have you seen? You mentioned five years you couldn't do things. What are the things we're doing right now that we couldn't do just a few years ago, and what do you think's coming around the corner? Uh, you know what, if you, later this afternoon I'm going to be doing a presentation up here where I'm going to have about 10,000 individual little characters running together, camera pans out, and they, they form the Intel logo. Uh, I couldn't have, I mean, three years ago I had 200 characters on my screen and I was blown away. I mean, I had a whole audience, thousands of people at our user group, ooh and aahing, that I had, you know, a couple hundred characters on the screen. Now I've got 10,000 on a laptop. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling how much we're able to push the envelope. Uh, just w with RAM and, and core speed and CPUs. And in the studios, what are they doing that's Im really impressing you these days? Uh, you know, bigger and better. The, uh, I'm, really, I'm really keen on the simulation side lately, so you know, just seeing things like fluid simulations where instead of, instead of simulating 30,000, 40,000 particles, you're seeing tens of millions of particles get simulated, and those give you just you know, waves that just look incredible where as before, it was a lot of uh, a lot of artwork in there, a lot of you know hand touching up every frame. Now, let the simulation just take take effect, and you get you know tiny little bubbles, all these little little tiny nu nuances that you just couldn't couldn't have before. Uh, there just wasn't really the RAM to hold all that. Tell me about how soft image is being used in, to make the special effects in some of the studios. Can you give some examples? Sure. Um, well, about five years ago, we came up with a technology called ICE, and uh, ICE is a fully multi-threaded visual programming language. So, absolutely takes advantage of all the cores that uh, that we have in the in the machines. And what that allows you to do is, through a very easy node-based interface, create crazy special effects, whether it be fire, rain, wind, well, I guess you don't really, well, you don't really see wind, but snow, how about snow? <laughs> uh, smoke? Smoke, <laughs> smoke, there you go, smoke. Uh, you know, and all of that, you know, the, the complexity of that, you know, we look at it in the films, and, and a lot of times we were looking at practical elements, you know, going out in the back lot. I've been at ILM before, and I've heard, you know, the, the lights go off on all the phones that tell you they're about to blow up stuff in the, in the back lot. They don't have to do that anymore. You know, everything is just mostly done now just through the computers, uh, and ICE is being used all over the place, which is, uh, which is great to so see. So compare that to, so like, ray tracing. I mean, what's, the, what's the difference between? Um, you know, you're are, at the end of the day, you are ray tracing those, those particles, those effects to achieve the look, uh, but what you wind up with is, uh, you know, thousands of little particles describe the, f the, the motion of the fire, and then you put your shaders on top of that to give it the transparency, the look, the believability that, that those little particles are now actually forming something that looks like fire. So that gets sent off to the ray tracer. And what's really unique about Soft Image is that not only do we have a fully multi-threaded programming language to create the particle flow, once we pass it off to the rendering engine, whether it be Mental Ray, Arnold, RenderMan, Render whatever, Ray. those also take advantage of all those cores. So we're really now in this, in this finally this nice era where the software, not only at render time, is taking advantage of, of our hardware, which is great. So what about other IO architecture? I mean, is, is Flash coming into the, to the equation yet, or what do you see uh, going on there? Flash as the... As, like as, as SSD, for example. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought you meant yeah. Flash as Adobe, Adobe Flash. Uh, no, that's yes, not, no, not SSD, relevant. oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, tremendous, you know, I, I, I build 
monstrous cache files. Uh, I mentioned that scene with uh, the little guys making the Intel logo. It's about 60 gigs of data, 4,000 frames. Every one of those frames, as I scrub the timeline, coming off a of conventional, especially on my, on my laptop, a little slow two and a half inch drive, yeah, that's a big bottleneck. I've got this you know, crazy cores, lots of RAM, but I'm just chugging as I'm trying to scrub through my timeline. With the SSDs, uh, you know, it's, it's real time. I've got one back there that's, that was, I just copied a file onto a 600 megabytes a second. Crazy. Yeah, John, you remember a Pauli Nist? It. We were at Oracle yeah. Open World, and she referred to the spinning disk as the horrible storage stack. Uh, so yes. as a software company, yeah. I mean, he, he I mean, you just <laughs> said you just basically uh, did the commercial for SSD. I mean, it absolutely changes the game. I mean, there's like Moore's law supposed to be double. You know, that just like <laughs> see ya, right? In like one year, I went from you know 30, 40 megabytes a second to 400, 500. You know, that doesn't happen very often. So what's the trend for the studios now? How, is you guys, how are you guys impacting their business model? Because obviously with speed, all kinds of disruptions happening. Um, what are the business model changes that you guys are a part of? And in general, what are their, their business models? How are they changing? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a mature market now. It's not, uh, you know, you don't go to SIGGRAPH and NAB anymore and, and you know, see the latest hair technology, which didn't exist before. You know, pretty much all the tools are out there to deliver effects that we've come to expect, which are you know, absolutely believable special effects, uh, character animation. So really, it's for us, it's just, it's increasing workflows. It's, it's a lot of training still. Um, the, the software is getting so complex. Uh, you know, I go to a lot of studios and just have training sessions with people who have been using Softimage or Maya or Max for 10 years. They're still hungry for that, uh, for that, for that knowledge. So our job now is to keep, develop, keep developing tools, um, listen to our customers, obviously. You know, that's a big part of my job is, is going to the studios, listen to the artists writing all that down and sending it off to Montreal to get it uh, incorporated into features. So, so what are some of the special effects that connect with the audience? I mean, some of the, the, the movie Hunger Games and Lord of the Rings, I mean, that's, is that all you guys? I mean, I, you know what, Autodesk, strangely <laughs> enough, now that uh, Max, Maya, and Soft Image are all under one roof, it's yeah. pretty much 90% of the effects you see out there, you know, and, and whether it be a character animation, whether it be, you know, I consider effects hair, you know, hair simulation, right, that's, sure. that's a crazy what effect. What are some of your favorites? Off. Oh man, uh, <laughs> you know Pixar always blows me away. Their yeah. uh, their water stuff. Pixar always has those shorts at the beginning of their films, yeah. you know. And it's always like, for me, that's the best part of the film because that's them just showing off, you know. So load up any uh, any Pixar movie, and those those shorts at the beginning just kill me. Just yeah. they're always pushing the envelope with those shorts. Uh, so yeah, I think those are my favorite. And then, geez, anything ILM does still uh, is is. I'm just having strange thoughts in my head of just cool <laughs> stuff blowing up, you know? I like explosions. <laughs> you like explosions, yeah, yeah. yeah. The phones don't go off, but the cell tower might get blown up. No, but seriously, now let's talk about democratization of media. So the film industry obviously pushing the envelope with animation. Do you see the special effects and animation world getting more integrated into just traditional broadcasting and corporations? Because you know, they're, they're kind of coming late sure. to the party, but yet with the price points and the ability talent-wise in the marketplace for developers, you know, it's a whole new renaissance going on here. Well, we need, we need to make it a little bit easier. Uh, you know, in the past, 3D was very complex. You didn't quite need a PhD, but you needed something to, to get some good effects done. And a lot of the broadcasters, you know, they don't have time to go learn how to make a crazy particle effect. They want presets. They want to be able to load up a simple piece of geometry. Uh, you know, Autodesk has delivered some really cool f uh, technologies like Shutterfly, where you can take pictures of, of people or objects. And people, people used to always ask me, can I just take a picture of that computer and have it be in 3D? No, that's ridiculous. I mean, you, just, you gotta model it. Of course you gotta model it. But now through some of the technologies we have, I can take a picture of that from you know, a few different angles, build myself a cool model of it, and literally drag and drop some presets to, as I like to blow things up, blow that thing up. You know, the geometry will fracture. Another preset can, can cause the geometry to look like it's on fire. Then another preset makes it smoke. So this Render has been the big out. innovation on ICE. So ICE really enables this visual programming. Sure. And, and that's really the key value for, the, for these developers, right? Yeah, for sure. And it, you know, it, it allows you to easily prototype. It is a true programming language, so you're, you're literally programming the effects, but we've really simplified it in a way to where you know, something that used to take 10,000 lines of code, I can do it in 20 nodes. Uh, and, and that's, you know, we're going we're gonna to see ICE technology in some of the other Autodesk products. It is, it is such an innovative, cool development that, uh, that we're going to see that in Maya. So we're talk about the, there. the demo you're going to do. Is this going to be the Intel? characters that you're going to do the logo? That's what's going to come in the afternoon? Yeah, so when I knew I was going to be up here, I, I decided to muck around with the Intel logo. So first I made it explode, and 
And I thought, you know, they probably don't want to see the logo <laughs> explode. All right. So <laughs> then I dropped the, it and the made branding's it. branding's going crazy. That's our branding. That's pretty much what happened. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, maybe I'll just make a bunch of little characters all come running together and they all stop uh, to form the Intel logo. And that actually brought some fairly unique challenges. So, you know, I have 10,000 characters all running from different angles. And then eventually they stop and then the guy behind them stop. Well, they, you know, ones that are need to get over here, they have to run around them. So all that technology of, of pathfinding and everything is in there. But when you're dealing with, you know, 100 characters, it's easy for everybody to, to nicely get to a, a point. But when you've got 10,000 guys and you want to pull the camera back and see them, you know, kind of take the shape of those letters, they're not humans. They need to have some intelligence. You know, you don't, you don't want them stopping and guys bumping into them. So just spent a little bit of time using some of the, uh, the new crowd technology we have in Soft 2013. And, and really, I mean, just in a couple hours, I had something that, you know, before would have taken... I don't want to say weeks or months because you probably, probably could have found a shortcut, but... Yeah, it's exp expensive, too. I mean, you very all expensive. the development time. Absolutely. So you had to essentially re-architect to take advantage of all these new cores, the SSD. Um, talk about that a little bit, and, and how yeah. far will this take you? Um, when we started developing Softimage, the second, the, the next generation of Softimage about 12 years ago, uh, there were no multi-core machines. You know, we were on a single core, CPUs. So, you know, we developed, we, we created the software, uh, awesome stuff. And then a few years later, I went to WinHEC, and here's Intel showing me this Prescott chip that had two cores in it. Oh, geez, what's, you know, this, this is going to go somewhere. And then they're telling me, oh, we're going to have eight cores in a few years. Yeah, I don't believe it. Well, here we are. So we actually had to go back and literally re-architect the entire core of Softimage to take advantage of those extra CPUs. And now it scales, you know, almost linearly. Uh, which is awesome. I've got the new E5 over there, uh, eight cores per socket, 16, threaded out to 32, and, man, the stuff is just flying on there. And it's really because we made the investment a while ago to re-architect the entire and, core of the and software. And that's not trivial, right, from a software no, developer no. standpoint. That that's was a, a big decision. That was five years that, uh, you know, I mean, has paid off in spades. The, the, uh, the speed at which I'm able to work, and I keep, on my home machine, I keep all the old versions loaded up, and it's, it's really funny to load up something that <laughs> my old demo scenes that I used to think were just crazy fast. I'm like, geez, even on a new machine, that's slow because it's all on the old single core. Load the same scene up on a, on a, a later build, and you know, stuff is just flying. So is, uh, do you feel like that's a, a core competence of Autodesk, or, or, or are you somewhat, because you've been around for a while, that, that handcuffs you a bit, you know, the, the innovator's dilemma? How, talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I don't, that's a good question. Not being so much on the development side, uh, you know, I don't think it's really a handcuff. It's it's been, you know, I mean, th that team, the team that built that core, they once they gained all that knowledge of, you know, programming 3D multi-threaded is not trivial. Uh, right. It took a lot of iterations of writing the core. I think at one point we just scrapped it and started all over. Uh, and now those guys are working on those, you know, the same team have been moved on to other places to to implement that in other Autodesk packages. So. Definitely, you know, good lessons learned. And then once you get on the curve, like you said, scales yeah. linearly, you're excited, and you don't want to have to do that every couple of years. <laughs> exactly. The uptake yeah. has been fantastic. Everyone we talk to uses your stuff, so yeah. it's congratulations. It's out Auto there for Desk. Sure. Great yeah. innovation. Mark, thanks for coming on theCUBE. My Appreciate pleasure. It. Thanks, okay. guys. Pleasure. Good great interview. Uh, te technology innovation enabled by great hardware and amazing software. Great bet paid off. Uh, Come back for the demo job. this afternoon. Demo yes, for demo sure. Demo this afternoon. <laughs> blowing stuff up. Blowing <laughs> stuff up. <laughs> I love the Intel logo blowing up, but I'd love to see that one. Okay, we'll be right back from theCUBE here at NAB Day 2. We'll be right back.